All right, we, we talked about tables last time, and we went over the basics of it. Tables really aren't that hard. Um, especially given the fact that it's good to keep your tables simple. All right? And I'll talk a little bit about what that means uh, today, about what it means to keep your tables simple. All right? We're going to go over a few more styling things, a few more tags uh, that you can use and uh, some accessibility issues regarding to them. So let's see what we left off with last time. We left off last time with this. Table that showed the average temperatures in these different cities uh, for different months. And if I can go back and remove the styling from this because we had just started to play with the uh, with the styling for this tables are pretty simple they consist of a table consists of a series of rows each row consists of a series of cells all right um, each cell is either a data or a header, all right? Um, the data is the actual data of the table. It's a value, a specific value. The header is sort of a descriptor that says what that particular column or possibly row means. So in this case, we have five rows in this table, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, the first uh, row consists of four table headers. The subsequent rows consist of four table data. So this is what we have. Table consists of rows, so we have five TRs. First row consists of THs. Second row consists of TDs, and as do the rest of the row. Generally speaking, when I talk about a simple table, and I'll elaborate on this throughout the class, um, Usually, uh, every table row is going to have the same number of data cells in it, all right, whether they be headers or, or that. You don't have to. There's actually something called a call span and a row span that allows you to stretch a column across two rows or to stretch a row over two columns. Um, it's better to avoid those. Like, for example... Let's say the, the February and March temperature in Los Angeles was 68 degrees. I could get clever and say that second 68, the column span is 2. And that means that that 68 goes over, sort of counts for two columns, counts for two cells. And then it will do this. sort of puts the 68 there and doesn't put anything there, all right? Call span equals 2, yeah, all right? But again, even if it was 68 for two months in a row, just put the 68 twice. That simplifies it a great deal, and it makes the table more accessible, and we'll talk more about accessibility later on. All, right. all these things we're talking about later on. I don't know what we're talking about now if we're talking about all these things later on. All right. Notice some things by default. By default, it makes each column as big as it needs to be, and as big as it needs to be is defined as the biggest field in that column. So, for example, in this table, Rio de Janeiro is the biggest thing in the first column. Therefore, that's how wide the first column becomes. If we were to add something and to, if we were to add Cleveland, comma, Cuyahoga County, comma, Ohio, USA, let's do that. Cleveland, Cuyahoga County, Ohio, USA, Earth. I guess I could have went up to North America and then Earth. I think I made the point. Then that becomes the biggest column. 
And so the column then takes that size. That becomes the biggest cell in that column. So that's the size that it takes. Um, all right. And so that's the defaults. That's the browser defaults. It's essentially the table will be as big as it needs to be. Each column is going to be as big as the biggest field in that column. So in these columns, actually the letters January, Feb, and March, uh, are Jan, Feb, Mar, are the biggest thing in those columns, so that's why they're that small. Question? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll be getting into that in a couple minutes. All right. I'm just showing right now sort of the default behavior for tables. All right. So styling. If we want the table to be a different size, we can style it. And we can style it any number of ways. We can say how big we want the whole table. We can say how big we want... Um, a TR to be, or we can say how big we want the TDs and THs, right? Any of those things we can we can do to to set the size of the table. Remember, because if we make make the rows a certain size, that's how big the table is going to be, and that's going to affect all of them intertwine. In other words, if I say I want the table a certain size, it's going to resize each row and it's going to resize each TD. Uh, if I say I want each row to be a certain size, well, that's going to resize the table, and that's going to resize all the TDs and THs. If I say I want the TDs or THs a certain size, well, that's going to size the rows, and then that's going to size the table. All right? Keep in mind it is possible to give uh, impossible instructions via your CSS. I could say I want the whole table to be 400 pixels wide, and I want each TD to be 200 pixels wide. Well, it can do both of those things, right? So what the browser will do is it will take a shot. It will do what it thinks is most reasonable, and it will not cut off any data, all right? So you can give conflicting uh, rules in your CSS, in which case the browser does the best job that it can to, to honor the rules that you've defined. So I can set the size of the table any number of ways. Uh, this is what I did last time as far as styling goes. I said the table width should be 80%. Now, whenever you give a percentage of, 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 uh, for a width, you always have to ask yourself, 80% of what? And the answer is it's 80% of the container. All right? Well, what do I mean by container? I mean 80% of whatever that tag appears in. So, for example, the body... And the section, I don't have any style rules on those. So by default, those take up 100% of the width. All block tags take up, by default, 100% of the width. And the body takes up 100% of the width. So the table is in the section, and I haven't defined any size for the section. Therefore, the size of the section is 100% of the width of the, of the entire window. The body is also 100% of the entire window. So therefore, if I say the table is 80%, the table is going to be 80% of the entire width of the page. All right? The entire width of the window. If I then say THs have a width of 25%, it will then, what is a TH in? Well, TH is in a TR, and the TR is in the table. So the TH is 25% of the table's 80%. So this 25% isn't 25% of the whole page, it's 25% of the table size. All right? And in this case, the table is 80%. So it's 25% of that 80%. So um, that would be 20% um, of the entire page, if my, if my math is right. All right? And again, because we gave a percentage, it's going to change size as I resize the table. Notice that at a certain point, it can't fit the full word Rio de Janeiro or Los Angeles in that 25%. So what does it do? It drops it down to a different line. The browser won't cut off any table data. All right? So if I make 
if, I, if the table becomes too small and it can't fit that word all the way through, it will, it will make it. If there, uh, and notice it, it breaks it up according to the spaces. If I happen to have a really long city name, what's the longest city name in the world? Well, I don't know either. All right, let's Google it. Somewhere in Europe. Longest city name in the world. All right, there's a Wales. Wales boasts, a, Wales boasts a village called something. All right, let's do the average temperature for that. change Los Angeles to that. <laughs> Notice that again We've said to make it 25%, but it can't do that. The whole table's 80% of the page. Each column is supposed to be 25%, but it can't do that without cutting off any of the data. Now, how is this different than Rio de Janeiro before? Rio de Janeiro has spaces in it, so we can cut it between Rio and D and put Janeiro on the next line, whereas this is, is all, one, uh, all one line with no spaces in it. So it can't cut it off. So again, the browser is actually really clever. All right. Um, one thing that I, I, I try to emphasize is when you're making your CSS rules, um, let the browser do its thing. You don't have to put rules for every little thing. The browser figures out how to do stuff. All right. And the browser is usually does a really good job figuring out how to do stuff. So you don't have to micromanage your CSS. All right. A lot of times, letting the browser do its thing will create good results for you. All right. And in this case, even though I've given instructions that the browser can't handle, all right, it can't make all the it, it can't make all columns 25% without cutting off some of that large city name. Um, it figures out a way to make it work. So the whole table is 80% uh, of the available space, and it just adjusted the size of the columns to accommodate the really long long data. All right, let me go and undo this. All right, so we're back to where we were before, and we can continue. Now, again, anything that, that deals with, like, I don't like the way that the data looks, I can change via CSS. For example, and, and it, especially if you can imagine there being more data, maybe if I had all 12 months of the year, it's not really immediately apparent whether that 18 is for January or February because this is centered over, this January is centered over the whole column and this is the whole column, all right? We could fix that a number of different ways. One way we could fix that is by putting borders around the stuff, just like uh, the suggestion was made. Like, what if we put a border around the thing and make it look like an Excel spreadsheet? Well, that's a good answer, right? So we could do that. That would be one way to do it. Another way to do it would be to center the, um, the, the TDs so that it lined up uh, in a column. So let's do that. Let's center them. So I can go TD, text align. center. All right, and that makes it more readable. Now it's clear that the 18 belongs to February and not January. Now, what if I wanted, what if I wanted these things to be right aligned? How could I do that? In other words, I want the first column to be right aligned, so it lined up over here. That might make it a little 
easier to read. How could I do that? Let me tell you what I can't do. I can't do this. Well, I can't, but it's not going to give me the result I want. Why can't I do that? It'll make all of them. In other words, I like the way these look. I want to keep those the way they are. If I change all of them, though, then we're back to the same problem we had before. So here's the thing. I want to change just this column. Right, I want to change just that column, and I don't want to touch the other columns. What do we do if we have an instance where we want to change some of the tags, but not all of the tags of a certain type? What do we use? We use IDs. The other things we could use would be what? Classes. classes. What do you think would be better here, to use IDs or use classes? Classes are probably better. And um, you know why it's better? Um, I'll, I'll tell you. Because, because uh, and this is a tip, if you ever take like an advanced HTML class, or if I gave a final in this class, and I ask, you have two ways to do something, classes or IDs, which way is better? The better way to do it is almost always classes, right? IDs is sort of the last resort when you only want to change one real specific item on the page and nothing else ever. All right, so I want to change everything in the first column to be handled a different way. All right, so I want to change more than one thing. So if I want to change more than one thing, I want to change it to uh, using a class. And if you think about it, this is where being lazy actually pays off for you. All right. All, all during your academic career, people probably told you not to be lazy, right? When you get into software development classes, people encourage you to be lazy, right? At least the right kind of lazy, <laughs> all right? There, there's like a good lazy and a bad lazy. The good lazy is where you make the changes in your code by changing the least possible number of things. So if I were to give each one of these an ID, I would have to write five different style rules. I could do that, and it would work. Um, but if I added another row, I'd have to add a sixth style rule, and another row a seventh style rule, and so on. The, the good lazy way to do it is to say, hmm, if I use classes here, I only have to write one style rule. One style rule is less than five style rules, Therefore, I've done only, only a fraction of the work. And that's good. That's a good kind of lazy. All right? When you can implement a change in a straightforward way. All right? Because if I have to change it again to undo that change, if I decide I don't like the way that looks, all right, then I can make the change very easily. So one of your guiding principles when you're writing code is Make the changes the, the simplest way possible so it's very simple to change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a class for the first column of each row. And I'm going to say my class name is whoops, first column. And I'm going to go and I'm going to put that class on every on every thing in this table. All right. So now I'm going to write a style rule for that. And how do you write a style rule for a class? You start with a dot. So I'm going to say dot first column. And then I'm going to say text align right. So that will just change the first column, and it will leave the other columns exactly as they are. Because we like the way the other columns were, right? It's just the first one that we want to change. So boom, there we go. 
and you know, that, that kind of looks the way that I want it to. Right? So we're, we're all set. All right? Now, the, the statement was made, how do you add grid lines to this to make it look like an Excel worksheet? Um, that is simply a border. All right? So I can do this. All right? I could say TD border one, one pixel solid black. All right. Do I have to add that border to the first column? Style rule? No. Why not? Well, this is a cascading part of cascading style rules. Remember, a style rule, uh, more than one thing, more than one style rule can apply to a given HTML element. So in other words, in other words, this here, is a TD that has a class of first column. Therefore, it gets the style rule for TDs, and it gets the style rule for first column. Now, in this case, the two style rules, again, have a conflict. Text align center in the TD rule, the class rule says text align right. Well, guess what? The more specific it is, so a class is more specific than an HTML tag rule, so that one is going to override. But the other rules are going to um, fall into place. So this will, the, the, the first column will still get this border. All right. So there we have the grid lines. Now notice, let me make it a little bigger. That doesn't really show. Notice there's a little gap between these things. This is a quirk of tables. All right. Tables sort of have a, a little gap between the table cells. And I don't know why. I don't like that. <laughs> All right? But there's an easy way to get rid of it. You can simply say on the table, border collapse collapse. That simply gets rid of the little gap between the table cells. So we have that. Now notice a couple things. Um, notice that the, 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 the first row doesn't have the, the, the borders around it. Why not? Well, because we define that style rule on the TDs. So the first row doesn't have TDs in it. Therefore, it doesn't get that. So I could simply copy that for the THs, and I'd be in business. Notice how Cleveland goes right up against that border. How could I make that not work that way? Could add padding, right? Because remember, padding is a space between the content of the cell and the border of the cell. So I could say, and I could put this a couple different places depending on exactly what I wanted to do. Actually, actually, uh, the first column looks right. I mean, the first column is the only one I want to change. The rest of them look just fine. So I could go and I could say, first column. I'm going to say padding right and give it five pixels. And that gives it a little bit of space and I think makes it look a lot better. And of course, we can do a lot more styling this if we want to. We could make the headers uh, really stand out by, by putting different colors in them. All right? So I could say, THs, I could give a background. 
background of gray, color black. Or make it color white. What the heck? To make it really different. All right. That makes the first row, the row of headers, stand out because the row of the, the row of headers is different than the other data. Right? The other data um, is, uh, you know, it, it's table data, and the um, other, uh, the, yeah, the other rows are table data. These are table headings. So I make the headings really stand out. Now, one problem that you have, uh, back in the old days when you had computer printouts, any of you ever see those big, wide computer papers uh, with printouts on them that went all the way across? Um, sometimes those are called green bar paper. Why do, why do they call it green bar paper? It alternated between green and white. It alternated between green and white. So there'd be like a green bar, a white bar, a green bar, a white bar, a green bar, a white bar. Why did they do that? Why do they alternate colors on the paper? The text was pretty hard to see. Because so the text was pretty hard to see, especially as you went across the, the, the page. All right? Because like back in the old days with computers, you didn't do stuff with fonts. And making it was just like it looked like a typewriter. If any of you have ever visited the Smithsonian and seen a typewriter, or talked to your grandparents about a typewriter or something like that, it was very. It was. It, it wasn't like elegant. It was just very functional. All right. It just outputted the data in a very plain sort of way. And your eye has a problem as you're reading across a long, a, a, a long line of of, of text. And the problem is, is that your eye, as you're scanning going across, your eye might go up a line or down a line, right? And that could be confusing if you're looking at a printout. You, you might confuse uh, different, different things on, on, on uh, uh, that, that something belongs to a different line than it actually does. So they use the green bar to sort of give your eye, the eye a guide so that, okay, I'm looking at, text in a green bar, so if my eye goes down to the, to the white bar, I know I've, I've crossed over to the other line. So I'm going to go and I'm just going to copy these rows of data a bunch of times in this table to give this table a bunch of rows. I mean, I don't, I don't care if it's duplicated data or not. I just want to demonstrate what a table with a bunch of rows could look like. And this would be especially true if there was a bunch of columns in here, too. So if you had a real long table, do I want to translate this page? No. All right. If I was reading this, and I was reading across, and especially if there was a lot of data, I feel like I have to yell today constantly. Ah. It's spring. Everyone's excited and happy. If I was going, again, if I was reading this across, especially if there were a lot of columns of data, I'm liable to read across Anchorage. My eye's liable to drift and say, well, the average temperature in Anchorage in March is 72 degrees, and eh, we know that's not the case. So, <laughs> that's all right. Uh, we could we could alternate uh, the, the the colors and in CSS3 there's actually a neat thing to alternate the rows. It's neat, but I don't remember how it is. So I'm going to look it up.
this is sort of a different kind of selector than we've seen so far. And this, the only time I've seen this be useful is with tables. TR nth child. All right. Um, even and odd. This is going to make the even TRs have a background color of gray. It's going to make the odd TRs have a background color of white. So, let's see what that gives us here. All right. First row is my row of headers. That's an odd row, right? So, you would think that this style row would kick in, but really, the TH is more specific than the TR. All right, so the TH rule takes precedence. Now, this row is the second row, all right? And because it's the second row, it gets the even rule, and that makes the background um, that, which is um, a shade of gray. And then the third row is an odd row, so it gets white, and it alternates all the way down the line. So this is just another way to make the table more readable. I would suggest this if you have if your table had a lot of columns and a lot of rows. All right, but you know this kind of looks good just like this, see, but even with a smaller table, it, it can it can look good. And again, this isn't just to make it look pretty. This is to help the user, the person reading the table, uh, understand how how things work and 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 be able to read uh, without their eye losing track of um, of where they are in the table. All right, let's see what else. Yes? Wait, how did you override the TH? Okay, yeah, let, let's follow the, 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 the rule. How, why does, what color will this row be? Well, it's the first row in the table. So you would think that it would get the odd rule, right? Because it's the first rule and one's an odd number. However, this is a style rule defined for a TR. So the rule is defined for TR. I also have a style rule defined for TH. And so the TH is more specific than the TR. So the TH rule takes precedent over the TR. All right? But it's, it still worked. It just made the, the ones that you thought were going to be gray look white. Because I counted the first one. As I it, yeah, it always counts the first row. Right. It, always, it, it counts all the rows. All right, so regardless, it counts, the, it counts the rows. So in other words, you know, it really doesn't matter to me if the evens or odds are gray. I just want it to alternate. So this is considered an even row, so it gets to be gray. This is considered an odd row. This one is an odd row, but the TH rule overrides the TR rule. So that's why it's the darker gray with the white print. I'm going to go and delete all the extra lines. Some of the other things we could do, we could actually make it so that there's only a horizontal border underneath it. All right? We don't want all the grid lines, but we just want a line between them. We could do that. How do we do that? Well, instead of saying border, remember if I say border, borders like margin and padding, all right, uh, it goes in all four directions. So if I say border one pixel solid black, there's a one pixel border on the top, a one pixel border on the right, a one pixel border on the bottom a one pixel border on the left. So I could make this and just say border bottom. Just give me the lines underneath it. All right. Yeah, you know, 
A lot of this is personal pre uh, preference, but this is a good way for us to revisit and review CSS rules. All right, so in this case, we only have the line underneath that. All right. Um, what else did I want to do with this? I just had something a second ago in my head. Oh, I can actually simplify this down. I can actually put the border on the TR instead of on the TD and TH. So I'm going to go and cut this code out. Cut this code out. And I can say TR. And it has the same effect. Because now I've said every row has a bottom border of black. And again, what do what rules do TRs get? They all get this row, so they all get the border on the bottom. The even ones get this row, a rule, the odd ones get this rule. There's a lot, there's, oftentimes there's a lot of ways you can do the same thing uh, in CSS. I put a star rule on the TRs and TDs, uh, or I'm sorry, the TDs and THs. I change it to put the star rule on the TRs. I guess I like putting it on the TR better because that's less coding to do. But really, um, you know, don't necessarily obsess and think that you have to find the perfect way. If you are aware of two different ways of doing things, the simple way is going to be better. The, the way that requires less work because there's less work to go and undo then if you ever decide that I don't want this. All right. If, for example, I were to look and say, oh, I don't want any borders on this, the alternating row color is enough, boom, I can get rid of that. One change and I've changed the whole table. I'm going to put them back, though, just to, to demonstrate. All right, now, there's, there's, we're going to cover some accessibility issues with uh, this, and we're going to cover some additional tags with this, all right? Um, if I were to ask you what does 8 represent, what, what do you do to determine that? You look up to see what column it's in and you look across to see the city that it belongs to. So, this represents Anchorage for February. All right? You do that sort of without thinking. You know, you've seen tables of data probably since you were a little kid in school. All right? So, you know how these things work. All right? And it's visual, you know. You know, a calendar is like this, right? You know, you find the week that you're in and, you know, what day is Friday? Well, you look across to Friday, and or, or yeah, you look across for whatever week you're in. You look up for the Friday column, and and that's the day. You know, that's that's the date they date that it is. However, if you can't see, you can't look across and look up, right? Just like with a form, how do you know what belongs to what in a form? Well, you visually look for the label to be next to the form control, right? The label that's next to the text box tells you what that text box is. Well, you can't do that if you can't see. So therefore, there's something that we can do pretty easily that adds an attribute that helps people with screen readers be able to identify stuff. And that is the scope attribute. There's actually a couple ways to do this. Let me Google it just to make sure. I can't remember if it's cow or column. It's cow.
putting a scope attribute here. I'm also putting a scope attribute on the city names. What does this do? Well, someone that has a screen screen reader can use the, the screen reader can use the scope attribute to identify G. If it's the third column, that means February. And the scope attribute of row says that this is sort of a header for the row. In other words, what city is this? It's Los Angeles. So the scope of column and row can sort of provide the screen reader the same thing that you get visually. So on the column headers, you put scope equals col, C-O-L. On the row headers, you say scope equals row. Now there's a lot of ways that you can do this. All right. Uh, there's, there's other ways that you can do this. You can use IDs and header uh, attributes and all this. But for most simple tables, the scope of column and row is enough to give people with screen readers the opportunity to um, have their device uh, help read the table to them and narrate it and make sense of it. Now, I've talked about simple tables. What do I mean by simple tables? Simple tables would be something like this, where you have... certain number of rows, each row has the same number of columns in it. You can really get crazy with tables. You can put tables inside of other tables. Guess what? That's not a simple table. That becomes a, a, a nightmare to maintain, and it becomes a, a nightmare from an accessibility viewpoint. Another example of is, let's say I wanted to do the same information for April, May, and June. All right? Would it be better for me to add a second table or to add additional rows to this table? So let's say I wanted to do April, May, and June. I would have three options. One option would be to add columns. All right? And maybe that's good. All right? Maybe that would be a good thing. But let's say I want to keep, the, the, I want to, keep to, to showing three uh, months at a time in my table to keep the table simple. I could do this. Where I made those new rows part of the same table. So here is the average temperature for Cleveland and the other cities for January, February, and March, and here's April, May, and June. That's generally not a good idea, right? Because it's very hard to tell then, is this May or is this February for someone who is using a screen reader? Better off to simply make two tables. So then each table just shows one thing. Each table has one set of headers. And it's not like some of the rows on the table mean one thing, some of the rows in the table mean another. I also would never use nested tables. I would also avoid doing the call span and row span, where you have a piece of data that goes across two columns. Because those are all things that complicate the table, makes it harder to maintain the table, and makes it harder from an accessibility perspective. So there it looks pretty much the same thing, right? Uh, but it's physically in two tables, and it will be much easier for people with a screen reader to understand this. All right? There's a handful of more tags that we can use. Uh, probably uh, one of them that's really good to use, both from an accessibility perspective and otherwise, is the caption tag. Caption tag should follow the table tag
by default, the caption is centered over the table. I can, of course, change that if I want, simply through CSS. Not going over everything you can change with CSS, because anything that we learned before about CSS, we can do now with tables, right? So if I wanted to space between the tables, I could say margin bottom 10 pixels. And if I want the caption to be bigger and maybe left aligned, I can say caption text align left font size 1.4 amp and color Just for laughs, let's make it um, a light or dark shade of gray. All right. So, simple tables. Each row has the same number of columns. Table only represents one thing. I'm not combining things in two in, from, that should be in two tables into one. All right. A couple other tags that I'm just going to mention briefly. They are useful for accessibility, and they are also useful sometimes for styling. Is T-head, T-body, and T-foot. The T-head goes around the headers. Now, ideally, if you have a simple enough table, you only got to have one row of headers. All right? But I have seen tables that have had multiple rows of headers. T body goes around the body of the table. In other words, all the data cells. And T foot would go uh, uh, around any footer rows. What what would a footer row be? What do you think you would put in a footer of a table? Any kind of asterisks or exceptions? Yeah, maybe maybe. Uh, well, you could put a lot of different things. Um, what I was thinking of is it's like maybe totals or averages. All right. So, for example, it doesn't really make any sense to talk about the average temperature of these four different places that are like spread all around the world. But I could say, could create a row average for all cities. And I don't know what the average would be. I'm just going to make up some numbers 52. 54. I could do that, and that row is a little different than the rest of the rows, right? It doesn't represent a single city, it represents an average. So it's sort of like the total or the average of the whole table. So I could put those in the T-foot area. This is helpful both from accessibility and from styling. Of all of these, the T-foot is probably the most useful because I could see having, you know, let's say if you had, uh, if you were showing a, a company's expenses in, uh, or a company's profits or anything like that in a, uh, in a table. Maybe you have, you know, a company, that there are different departments and their profits for the past 10 years or something like that. You might want to have a row that says average profits by department and have a, have a cell for that, just like you would an Excel, Excel worksheet. If you put in the T-foot attribute, again, that's useful from an accessibility perspective, but styling-wise, you'd have to go in and you'd have to put a style rule Let's make this really 
stand out and put a background color of yellow. Didn't do anything. Why not? Well, this is a case where the browser, we gave, we gave sort of conflicting rules and the browser implemented one that we didn't want. So this rule overrode this rule. How can we make that rule work? I can say table TR background yellow. Still doesn't work.